May 21st is a big day for this show. Uh, in fact, in a lot of ways, it's the show's birthday. Now, officially, our birthday is January 17th of 2013. That was the day that our first episode debuted. But there was an aborted start that happened about 600 days earlier or so. Uh, I've talked about it on the show before. Uh, Heath, myself, and a third friend who wanted to be part of the show until he saw it was going to require work and stuff, decided to start, and we set May 21st of 2011 as the date of our first practice record. Now. What we learned that night was that audio capture was harder than we were given it credit for, and we were a long ways off from ready for prime time. So ultimately, we gave it a significant period while we gathered up all the equipment, learned what we were doing, you know, researched hosting, decided not to do it, all of that. We just kind of stopped. And eventually, Lucinda got sick of me talking about it and not doing it, so she just bought me a microphone and a book and gave me a swift kick in the ass. So that's our origin story, but I'm reminded of that aborted start every year at about this time because even though The Scathing Atheist as a podcast was born on January 17th, No Illusions was born on May 21st. Now, I'm pretty sure Twitter still lists that as my birthday because I was trying to be surreptitious and using my real birthday would have fucked that up. Now, this was the time of the year when I first bought scathingatheist.com. It's the time that I first set up my No Illusions email address and Twitter account and Facebook page. So all of those sites send me emails reminding me to, you know, buy my alter ego a cake around now. But as Eli mentioned in the intro, there's another reason that May 21st of 2011 is particularly memorable. In fact, if I ever forget when that first attempt at the show began, I just Google, when did Harold Camping say the world was going to end? Because... Not coincidentally, the date we chose for that record was also the date he and his acolytes lined the streets of New York City confident that the rapture was about to begin. Of course, we all lived in the city at the time, and we saw him. Knowing we were going to be doing our first record of a atheist podcast that night, we stuck around the city for a while after we got off of work, and we stood on the other side of Fifth Avenue from them reading their signs, watching their hopeful little faces, and, and I don't remember the exact time, but they but they had it down to the minute, right? Campling had predicted that the apocalypse was going to start at 4.18 or something, and it was, it, was, it was something like that. It was like 4 something in the afternoon. So there they were, right in the den of sin and iniquity itself, leering at all the evildoers, salivating over the coming judgment, and then at the appointed minute, nothing fucking happened. Um, or actually, it was even better than that. In New York City, it started to rain at exactly the minute that the world was supposed to end. So, you know, we got we got like dark clouds rolling in and everything. And they were fucking giddy. And they seemed shocked that the dark clouds weren't enough to sway us, right? But, you know, maybe forgetting that dark clouds happen all the fucking time. So, so we get this light little drizzle of rain and then it just stopped and the sun came back out. And the world just carried on existing. And we watched them realize that nothing just happened. We watched their whole universe fall apart. And at first I felt bad for reveling in it so much, but then I remembered that the thing they were so disappointed in was the fact that I wasn't presently being raped to death by a scorpion locust, and I felt fine again. And look, I, I know I've told this story on the show before, but it's worth bringing it up now and again so that we can all be reminded what they're after. I mean, I get that there are no Christians actively calling for all the non-Christians to be massacred through heinous torture, or very few of them anyway, but most of them are kind of rooting for that, and that shouldn't just disgust you. These motherfuckers are in power. That should terrify you. You know, they want vindication for their worldview more than they want you to survive. So they've kind of, you know, they're already primed to look the other way if all us terrible heathens started to die. And I'm not saying that Christians are on the verge of marching non-believers to the gas chambers, but I am saying a lot of them would be grinning ear to ear if that happened, as long as the soldiers marching us in had wings and halos. You know, it's not just the lunatics that followed Harold Camping's numerological musings here. I've listened to many a cookie bacon grandma wax poetic about the rapture, knowing full well that at some fucking point in their rapture, the blood reaches the bridles of the horses. That's our blood they're talking about. You know, the big takeaway for a lot of the media that day was about how wrong the believers were. Every news outlet wanted to stick a camera in their face at like one minute post rapture and ask them how they felt now that they knew that they were mistaken and let's face it, stupid. But that's not what lingers for me. I, you know, Christian people are wrong all damn day by definition. Christians being obviously and ridiculously incorrect either doesn't have an anniversary or it has 365 of them and a quarter, you fucking pedants. 
Okay, not quite a fucking quarter, you overachieving pedants. The point is that for a terrifyingly large percentage of Americans, a, a majority even, their paradise requires that you burn an eternal torment. And judging by the looks on their faces seconds after they thought that was going to happen, based on their loathing and their utter void of sympathy, that's not just a theological requirement. That's part of what makes it paradise.